books to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're finishing up our series, Behind the Selfie. Have you had fun with this series, Behind the Selfie? We've had some fun with it, haven't we? But I think that uh, it's really hit us, some of us, really where we are, because oftentimes we do take a picture of ourselves. We call it a selfie. We may put it on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever you do, and we're always smiling and everything seems to be okay. But behind the selfie, sometimes there's stress. Sometimes there's anxiety. Sometimes there's fear. Sometimes there's anger. Sometimes there's all kind of emotions that are behind the selfie that we don't let anybody else see. And one of those things may be inferiority. How many of you have ever felt inferior in your life? Would you raise your hand? A lot of us have. A lot of us have been there. And so we want to ask the question today, can God really use somebody like me? I mean, can God really, I mean, really, really use us for his glory and his honor? Well, let's look together in 1 Corinthians 1.26. Notice what the Word of God says. The Bible says, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish. Everybody say foolish. Things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak. Say weak. The weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things. Say base Come on, help me out. The what? The base things of the world and the despised, say despised, and despised God has chosen. The things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you're in Christ Jesus. Who became, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Let's pray one more time. Father, bless the reading of your word today, and show us and teach us from your word, Lord, that you can use each and every one of us. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, some people just kind of feel inferior. And all of us have probably been there before. Some people kind of live in that state and they've let the devil just kind of drill that in. You're, you're inferior. You'll never be used to, of God. There's nothing. Maybe it's because of your past. Maybe it's because of a failure. Maybe it's because you tried something. It didn't work. You failed. And so you've got in your mind that I just cannot do this thing called life. I heard on one occasion about a preacher. <laughs> he was at breakfast one morning and he asked his wife, he said, honey, honey, how many just great, great preachers do you believe there are in the world today? And she looked back at her husband and she said, I don't know, but I believe that there's one less than you think there is. Sometimes people help us feel inferior, don't they? Some, Madison hadn't got that yet. Sometimes, she's looking at Blake, sometimes people encourage us to be inferior because they tell us we'll never do anything. They tell us we'll never amount to anything. Matter of fact, I see this all the time with young people. We've got parents, mom and dad don't ever do this. Let, mom and dad, tell your kids what they can do for Jesus. Don't tell them what they can't do. But now I've seen parents and they just beat their kids down. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never do anything. Listen, you keep telling your kids that, they'll live up to your expectations. And they'll never do anything. But I believe that God can take you and I and use us for his glory and his honor. Let me tell another cheesy joke, Madison. I heard about this, um, this guy. He was in church, and he was singing this special music, you know. It was, it was a traditional church right before the sermon. Brother Steve, they had a special music, you know. And this guy got up and sang, and, and uh, when he got through singing, they began to holler out, sing it again. And he got, oh, man, I'm, I must be pretty good, you know. And he, he got all full of pride, and he was excited, you know. And he sang that song again. And they said, sing it again. He thought, wow, man, I must be better than I thought I was. And he sang it again, and he got done the third time. And they said, sing it again. He sang it again and again until finally he finished singing. He said, why do you want me to keep singing this? He said, you, they said, you're going to sing this until you get it right. Sometimes people help us to feel inferior, right? 
Sometimes, let me just do a survey with you real quick, okay? Let's answer these questions. Let's just do a little survey. And I want you to just be extremely honest. Forget about being humble, okay? You, you never heard a pastor say that before, have you? Forget about being humble right now in this moment. I want you to just tell the truth. Now, let's do a survey. How many of you have ever been listed in who who in high school or college or middle school? In a, raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. Be honest. All right, put your hands down. How many of you, maybe you played sports in high school or middle school? How many of you were a pretty good athlete that you, um, maybe you were player of the week or player of the month or player of the county or um, you got um, uh, all district or all region or all state or what have you, but uh, you got some kind of athletic honor. Would you raise your hand? Come on, raise your hand if you got that. Okay. All right, put your hands down. How many in the house have earned a, say, master's degree or a doctor's degree? Would you raise your hand? All right, put your hand down. Hmm. How many of you ladies in the house have ever won a beauty pageant of any kind? Maybe it was a kid, maybe it was in high school, or maybe it was Miss America, I don't know, whatever. Raise your hand. Billy, raise your hand. All right. All right. Okay, let me ask you a couple more questions. How many of you have ever been president of your class? You're president of your class? Okay, wow. Um, how many of you were, were voted most likely to succeed? Raise your hand. <laughs> Bunch of failures. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor. Now, here, here's the deal. Now, here's the deal. If you raise, watch this. Now, watch this. If you raise your hand for any of these things, I want you to understand. Listen closely. I've got great news for you. God is can use you too. Right? God can use you. Now, he may have to work a little harder, but God can use you. Seriously, I'm not being facetious. What I'm saying, I'm serious. God takes, the Bible says, what does the passage say? God takes the foolish things. God takes the weak things. God takes the base things. God takes the despised things of this world, and he uses them for his glory and his honor. Now, here's God's plan. God takes ordinary people and he does extraordinary things with them to give, here it is, him glory. Not us glory, but to give him glory. Let me give you three things I want you to jot down. Three things. We're going to spend a little bit more time on the second one, but I want you to jot down three things. Number one, I want you to see God's ordinary people. God's ordinary people. There are four words in verse 27. Look at them one more time with me. In verse 27, the Bible says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things uh, of the world, and the despised God has chosen. Let's just kind of do a study, okay? This is not Sunday school class, I know, but this is very important. I want you to know, jot these four words down, and then right out beside what they mean, and what they, we get from them from the original Greek language which the New Testament was written in. The Bible says he used the foolish thing. That comes from the Greek word that we get our word moron from. Moron. It literally, here's what it, it literally means the non-intellectual. It means not the PhDs, not the Phi Beta Kappas. All he's saying is God uses Ordinary people to do extraordinary things. What's the next word? Let's look at the next word. It's the word weak. It literally means without physical strength. And then there's base, a low degree. Uh, people from the wrong side of the tracks or not the blue bloods, if you will. The base. Then the despised, the things looked down upon. Things the world scorns and ridicules and laughs at. What are these? Friend, these are ordinary people. Now, notice in verse 26, he says, not many. Now, it's important. Look in verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many. Not, it doesn't say not any. It said not many wise. Not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty. Not many noble. It doesn't say not any. It says not many. So, I, listen, I thank God. 
I thank God for the PhDs. I thank God for the doctors. I thank God for the athletic stars. I thank God for the Tim Tebow's who have lived his life for Jesus Christ and given God all the glory. I thank God for the beauty queens that get up and after they win a, a, a crown on their head and they say, I give all the glory and praise to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I thank God for those kind of people. I, I really, really do. But here's the deal. God is saying in this passage, listen, I take the low, I take the weak, the base, the foolish, the despised, and I use them and shape them for my glory. The Bible says, study this, show yourself approved unto God. You may not have a PhD, and God still expects you to work hard. Now, just because you're not a PhD, or you're not a doctor, or you're not some athletic star or some beauty queen, it doesn't mean that you can be lazy. He's not talking about that. He's saying that God takes the ordinary people, but then we got to work hard. But God says, I'll take you and shape you and use you. I heard about a preacher years ago that had a reputation of being a great fox hunter. Now, he wasn't much of a preacher, but he was a great fox hunter. And on one occasion, uh, there was a Quaker, an old Quaker, and met him on the street, and he said, this is what the Quaker said, and I quote, he says, if I were a fox, I would hide me where thee could not find me. And the preacher said, where is that? He said, in thy study. Folks, here, here's the deal. We still got to work hard. By the way, I hear people say, well, that preacher is boring. How can a preacher be boring when he's preaching the word of the living God? The word of God's not boring. The Word of God's not boring, so therefore, maybe he's not preparing, maybe he's not studying, maybe he doesn't, he's not in the Word like he ought to be in the Word. But whatever it is, God takes ordinary people, he takes the weak and the foolish and the base and the despised, and God uses them for his glory and his honor. Now, number two, not just God's ordinary people, but number two, God's extraordinary power, because this is where it's at, my friend. This is where it comes from. Look in verse 30 with me. The Bible says in verse 30, but by his doing, you were in Christ Jesus. But by his doing. Say his doing. His doing. Say it with me. His doing. But by his doing. Not your doing. Not my doing. But by his doing. But by his doing, you are in Christ. Who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I am in Christ. You are in Christ. Christ is in me. Christ is in you if you're a born-again child of God. Jesus has righteousness. Jesus has wisdom. Jesus has sanctification. Jesus has redemption. All where? In me. In you who are children of God. Here's the truth. God doesn't want us to do anything for him. He wants to do something through us. Man, I hear people say, Christians say, oh, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I've tried and I can't do it. Let me say something to you. You're right. You can't do it. Say, I can't. Come on, I can't. We can't do it. I can't do it. You can't do it. But friend, listen to me. The power of God from the Most High. Oh, friend, if that ever grabs hold of our hearts, man, that's a, that'll make a backslidden Baptist shout and turn a flip. I mean, God, here it is. God, church, lives in us. Wow. God lives in us. So it's not us. We can't do anything. You and I, I can't, I can't live the, my, the life for Jesus that I need to live, but God lives that life in and through me. Remember, it is God who works in us and through you and I to do His will and to do His good pleasure. Can we just go back to these four words one more time? Can we do a word application just real quick? Here's the word foolish. Remember what the word foolish means? It comes from the Greek word we get our word moron from. It's a non-intellectual. It's not the PhDs. It's not the Phi Beta Kappas. It's the non-intellectuals. It's the non-cultured. There was an old preacher 100 years plus ago. His name was Billy Sunday. Has anybody ever heard of Billy Sunday? Would you raise your hand? All right. Some church folks have been in church for a while. Maybe you've heard that name, Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was an awesome evangelist. But to be honest with you, if Billy Sunday was living today... And Billy Sunday went into most churches in America today. 
they'd kick him out. He'd preach one sermon and they'd not invite him back. I mean, Billy Sunday would get up on the platform. I mean, he'd take chairs and use his illustrations and break the chairs on the platform. He'd turn flips. He, he used slang language. I mean, he was an acrobat on the platform. He was an old baseball player and prize fighter. But God saved him. He gave his life to Jesus. He was an intellectual. He didn't talk good. He wasn't trained, Steve. He didn't have all the intellectual uh, things that some people who have been to college and seminary had had. As a matter of fact, Billy Sunday, in his biography, they called him God's joke to the ministry. I mean, Billy Sunday just didn't have what most have, and yet he still won over a million people to Jesus Christ before the days of TV and satellite. Wow. Why? Because God took, here it is, God took an ordinary person and did extraordinary things with him. Foolish, foolish. Number two, what's the next word? The next word's weak, physically weak. How many of you, let me ask you another question. How many of you have ever heard of David Ring? Would you raise your hand? David Ring. David Ring is an evangelist. He's a Southern Baptist evangelist, but he has cerebral palsy. Brian, you know, he, he stands up and he'll say something like this. He says, my name is David Ring. I have cerebral palsy. What's your problem? What's your problem? Man, that's convicting, isn't it? I mean, here's this man that's traveling all over the globe preaching the Word of God, and he's physically, he can barely stand. He can barely walk, and it's getting worse and worse the older he gets, and yet God is taking this ordinary man, this weak man, and doing great things with him for the glory of God. The next word is the word base. From the wrong side of the tracks, if you will, not the blue blood. I'm thinking about a man in the Old Testament. His name is Gideon. You ever studied the life of Gideon? Gideon's a very interesting man. An angel appeared to Gideon and called him a mighty man of valor. Now listen to this. Gideon, <laughs> Gideon was the furthest thing from a mighty man of valor. I mean, he really wasn't, and yet the angel called him that. He was the furthest thing. He was a chicken. He was afraid. He was living in fear. He was hiding out. And then he said, I've chosen you to deliver my people from the hands of the Midianites. And Gideon's like, what you talking about, Willis? You know what I'm saying? Gideon's like, who? None of the young people have a clue what that means. Me? You're talking to me? 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 You want me to lead? <laughs> you want me to deliver these folks to the Mennonites? Gideon said, my family's the poorest family in Manasseh. Man, I come from the wrong side of the tracks. I'm not the kind of person that you would want to use. I'm the least in my father's house. He was saying, I, you can't use me. And he had 300 men. He had 300 men and whooped the Midianites, and God got the glory. Blake, would you grab my jacket for me real quick? It's behind the side of the little wall there. I want to illustrate this point with this sports coat. As a matter of fact, it's very hard to find a sports coat. I don't use, they wear one much anymore. Hold that sports coat up, will you? Well, it's a good-looking sports coat, isn't it? Probably needs to be dry, clean. Hold it up straight, man. Hold it up straight. I want to talk to my sport coat, all right? And we talk to, I feel like the, you know, Tom Hanks talking to a soccer ball, but I'm going to talk to my sport coat. Hey, sports coat, how you doing? Will you shake my hand? Oh, it's not going to happen, is it? Okay. Well, let's think about this. Look at this sport. Everybody look at it. Are you looking at it? Look at this sports coat. Coat? Stand erect. Okay. Well, it's doing that, but you're, you're helping it there. Coat? Coat. Wave your arms. Coat. Wave your arms. Coat. Turn around. Coat. Turn around. Coat. Jump up and down. Dumb coat. What's the problem? Blake, I want you to put the coat on. Coat, wave your arms. Coat, jump up and down. 
Boy, it's going all over YouTube. <laughs> Colt, turn around and around and around. Keep going until you get dizzy, Colt. Come on, turn, turn, turn. Wave your arms again now. Go around and around at the same time. Go, 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 go. Stop, Colt. What, what are you saying, Pastor? Stand right there, Colt. Don't move, Colt. It's very interesting. The Bible said, the Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with Gideon. Folks, listen. Take your coat off. Thank you, Blake. Here's the deal. You and I, you and I, we're just this. We're base. We're weak. We're foolish. We're despised. Here it is. And without the presence and the power of God in us, we're nothing. Nothing. But with the presence and the power of God in us, we can do great things for the Lord. We can whoop up on the devil. We can stomp on him. We can stand up. We can praise the Lord Jesus Christ. We can give him glory. But without Jesus Christ giving us strength and power, listen, friend, I'm, I'm here to tell you, you say, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. I've tried and I can't. Listen, it's time for you to start exchanging the power. No, you can't do it. I can't do it. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God inside of us can do it through us. Hmm despised things broken down you remember the story in the Bible about David and Goliath little old squirt David maybe maybe you've heard the story he was just a little kid David came up and saw what Goliath was doing to the children of Israel he said why won't anybody go out and fight that man they're like David what you smoking man He's like, why won't anybody go out there and fight him? David! Dude, you're in a bad dream. The dude's nine foot six inches tall. Why won't anybody go out and fight him? David was just a little kid. A little kid. God takes the nobodies of this world, turns them into somebodies for him. David got him a move stone put it in a slingshot he didn't have one of those kind he had one of these kind he put that smooth stone in there and he went out there he said how dare you talk about my God <laughs> Goliath don't dead dead here's the deal friend despised God takes the nobodies I'm not calling you a nobody but I want you to understand see what I'm saying here? God takes those of us that without Christ we really have no power God takes you and I and he turns us into somebodies for him number three and I close this message God's sovereign purpose verse 29 the Bible says so that no man may boast before God Friend, we should never, ever boast. Because if we do anything, if we accomplish anything, it's not us. It's God. Here it is. God working through us, right? You're going to see a lot, a lot, when you see photos on, on our Facebook page, SoQuest Facebook page, you're going to see a lot of times we're going to hashtag whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, we're going to hashtag 5,000. Has anybody ever seen that before? And you're wondering, what does that mean? God gave me a vision before we moved here that we're going to reach 5,000 people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what that means. We're going to reach 5,000. We're going to win 5,000 people to Jesus Christ, and they're going to, we're, going to, we're going to disciple them. We're going to be growing Christians. That's our goal. That's our vision, to do whatever it takes to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are lost, 
and unchurched, 5,000 people. You know what I believe God's going to do? I believe God's going to do that plus a whole lot more. But here's the deal. When it happens, I didn't say if it happens. I said when it happens, and we may go from facility to facility to facility before we end up buying something. We may be here for a while. We may fill this one up and then go to two services in here and then maybe three services in here and then we, God may promote us and give us another bill. I don't know what, I don't know, I don't even want to know. I just want to ride the wave. But I'm telling you, friend, when God does it, we don't ever need to look back at ourselves and say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, I'm good, aren't I? Mm-hmm, I did it. Yeah, I did it. No, you didn't do it. I didn't do it. We didn't do it. God did it. God did it. God did it. And God is to get all the glory. There's no boasting in heaven, I don't believe any boasting here, the highest calling in the world is to be in the very center of God's will for your life. What has God called you to do? Don't be afraid. Don't feel inferior. Just answer the call. What is God calling you to do, friend? Answer the call of God upon your life and get busy doing what God's called you to do. God can use you. You say, well, I'm just a lay person. I'm not a preacher. we got to get this Americanized mentality of Christianity and calling out of our minds. Listen, every time I go overseas and do ministry or preach crusades or do mission work, man, every time somebody gives their life to Jesus overseas, every one of them are preachers. I mean, they are. When you give your life to Jesus in another country, most countries, man, they all, they all just start preaching the Word of God. They share the Word of God. Well, God didn't call me to preach. God did call us to make a difference. Man, he's got a perfect plan for our lives. Tell the devil to go to heaven. Amen? Scared you didn't, huh? Devil keeps telling you. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never do anything. You're hiding behind your smile, but deep inside you're like, man, I don't know if I can ever do anything great for God. Friend, I'm telling you, you, upon the authority of the Word of God, God can take you and me, ordinary people, and do extraordinary things through our lives. What does He call you to do? Be available to Jesus. You be you. You be you. You say, every one of us are different. Every one of us are different. Some of us look like this. Steve, stand up. Please, I got to you the perfect guy. And some of us look like this. I will. <laughs> We're different. You know what I say? Be you. You be you. You do what God's called you to do. You look like you want to look. You go where, you, listen, friend, you be you. God can take you, whoever you are, and use you to do extraordinary things. God is looking for somebody today just like you. Just like you. Madison, if you'll come play for me please God can take you God can take I never will forget Steve reminded me of this Steve's an old a long time friend we haven't seen each other in a long time but we reconnected lately and he's helping us but he reminded me when I was 16 years of age he was in that service when I walked for 17 years of age, I got saved at 16, at 17 years of age at First Baptist Church in Milan, Tennessee. He reminded me, he said, I remember that day. You walked down that aisle and you took that pastor, Dr. Don Whip, by the hand and you said, I feel God calling me to preach. I said, yeah, I remember that day well. And honestly, honestly, you may not believe this, but it's the gospel truth. Up to that point in school, when teachers made you do a book report, y'all know, remember the book reports? You read a book, you stand in front of the class, and you give a report on it. Teach, if we got teachers in there, quit doing that. I hated that. You know why? You know what I would do? Because I was scared to death to get up in front of a crowd. I would not do it. I'd stay home. I was sick. Not really, but I stayed home. 
I took a zero. I wouldn't do it. Scared to death. You? You get up in front of people and you run around and talk and speak all the time? Scared to death. I never forget when I walked that aisle and I think, Lord, what are you doing? Me? You want to take me? You want to use me to be a preacher? I'm like, okay, God, but I guess you know what you're doing. But me? A person who would not even get up in front of the class? Scared to death? And I took that preacher by the hand. I said, I'm surrendering to the call on my life. He said, okay. Next Sunday night, you're preaching your first sermon. He ju I jumped right in. Scared to death. Talking about sick. I had a stomach virus for a week up to that point. Scared to death. Sunday night came. He gave me a Sunday night, not a Sunday morning. Smart man. I said, I don't know how to prepare a message. He gave me a book. It's called Simple Sermons. He said, take one of those sermons out of there, Brian, and just memorize it. Okay. Isn't that like plagiarism? Just do it. I preached on the, the devil. I had no clue who the devil was, really. Just getting started in Christianity, been saved less than a year. Memorized that sermon, got up and preached it. When I practiced it, it was 32 minutes long. When I preached it, it was 7 minutes and 32 seconds. I never will forget this. I ne and I know that people didn't mean it this way. But I never will forget when I finished that sermon. I didn't know how to close the message. I sat down. At the end of the sermon, he called me to stand up there, and people came by and shook my hands. And they looked at me, and they shook my hand, and they hugged me, and some of them were even crying. And were like, poor pitiful Ronnie. That's the way I took it. He'll never make it. Here's what I'm telling you today. God can take ordinary people like me and like you and do extraordinary things with us. Don't buy into that lie. God can use you.